Laura, you have an extensive background in education, from teaching and coaching to leading in the education and the space. I'm curious, how has your experience as a teacher influenced your approach and perspective in your CS career? Now, I think as a teacher, you're constantly faced with many students who have not the same expectation or understanding or even needs of what they need moving forward. And your job is always to be really empathetic to what they're bringing into school every day, to be really adaptable to all the things that they need and the ways that you're trying to move them from where they are to where they can get to. And then you need to really clearly communicate what it is that you're trying to get across and also understand what they're trying to tell you. And so I think more than anything else, as a teacher, you realize that you can't try the same thing with all of your students and expect that it will work since they are all different human beings and we are all different human beings. And then I was also an instructional coach. And so as a coach, I think I learned this even more is that all of the teachers that you're working with have very unique needs. And so to meet all of those needs, You've heard this from many other teachers. I know you try to address all the different learning styles, all the challenges that they're presenting. You're just constantly being adaptive around the methods that you're using, the way that you're communicating, the modalities through which you're communicating. You just want to make sure that everyone that you're working with feels really confident and comfortable with whatever material it is that you're trying to share with them. And then as I joined the success side, it felt really similar. So I'm basically just a coach now on the other side. And I really have to seek to understand all the different varied needs that all of the people I work with, usually still teachers and school leaders, need adapt any strategies that I think might help and communicate really effectively. Um, and every once in a while, I'll start a conversation and I'll realize that this is not going the way that we wanted to. Neither of us are understanding each other. And so I need to pivot my strategy, my style, the way that I'm understanding what their issues might be so that I can help them reach their goals. And really, as I work with more and more both educators and school leaders, I realize that they just want to build and maintain that trust with their students or with their staff. And so my role is just to find what is it that you are trying to influence in your school? What is the culture you're trying to build? What are the goals that you have? And how can this specific tool that I'm working with help you address that goal? But the approach, right, it's actually really similar and the perspective is really helpful in that you understand how difficult it is to focus on any one thing when you are a teacher since you're constantly thinking of the other 36 students or the other 50 teachers. Uh, and on this side, I try to just make that really simple so that I can help you address this challenge. We can tackle this one together and that frees up the rest of your day to address all of the things that your kids and your teachers need from you. The question I have now comes from my perspective as a parent, one who is deeply invested in finding the best educational environment for her child. As the director of success at Life School, how does your work in customer success contribute to shaping a positive school culture and influencing student behavior? Yeah, I think we all want to know that the schools that our students or our children are attending are safe places, that hopefully there's an element of fun and excitement and our kids want to go to school every day and that they feel like it's a place where they are challenged to continue learning, but rewarded for doing the right thing. And so my focus is really just empowering educators to recognize and reward those students when they do the things that we want them to do. But you can imagine like you're a teacher and you really want your students to collaborate well together or you want them to jump in and be really helpful to one another. So what my role is now from a live school perspective is I reach out to the educators, find out those things that they want to encourage amongst their students, help them create that rubric of the things that they're looking for in their kids, and then make it very transparent to the students and to the families that this is what we're looking for. And then they give points to the students who are demonstrating collaboration, who are working together really helpfully, who are sharing ideas with each other, who are jumping in to help their peers. And so as the teachers positively reinforce, they're calling out, they're praising them, they're saying thank you, and they're giving them these points, that reinforcement that encourages the other students to also start collaborating. Some of them may be for the very first time, right? They may have never collaborated before, but they see that their fellow student is doing it and getting praise for it. So they want to do that as well. And that then continues to cultivate this really supportive atmosphere that we are all here to help one another. So we're building up that safe space where we can all come to school and try new things and know that we're going to get that support from other students as well as our teacher. 
And then one step further that I think is particularly helpful about having a digital tool is that we facilitate that communication between everything that you're doing as an educator your students, and your students' families, right? So now the families are also seeing a report or they're getting those notifications that they're seeing when their children are creating that collaborative environment, when they're sharing, when they're helping others. And they get to have that essentially like weekly report that says, here are all the great ways that your kid was a really awesome superstar in school this week. And all of that's focused on all that positive behaviors and celebrating that. And so when I was in the classroom, I would try my best to make those positive phone calls home, right? I'd, I'd know that Nefertiti was doing an amazing job. And so I'd call up her mom and I'd say, oh my gosh, she's a blessing in my classroom. I really appreciate her. But I did that maybe once a month because I was so focused on all the other elements of classroom management. Now I basically get to help teachers share all of the really great things that their kids are doing with their families every day. So instead of it just being something where that mom hears from me once a month, she can now see every single day how you know well Nefertiti is doing in class. Uh, and so I basically just get to sit here and, and help educators celebrate all the positive things that are happening and hopefully make it so that parents like you get to see the really great things that your kids are doing as opposed to wondering what happens in school every day and are they doing the right thing? Yeah, I think that's, that's the reassurance and the fact that the kids are spending basically 70 or 80 percent of it's fine with the schools with all the speakers that we have. If you want to know him in a safe environment, you know, environment that appreciate, appreciates it, that it treats it and emphasizing on its unique value. So it sounds, I would say, reassurance and it gives to a parent the peace of mind that his kid is, is okay. Yeah. And, and you get to celebrate it at home using very similar language, right? So you're like, Thank you for being collaborative today. And I, as an educator or a school leader, appreciate you using the same language with your kids that we're practicing in school every day. Now, I want to ask what you about beginnings. When you first joined the live school and also thinking back to your start a uh, screencasting right? how did you kick things off? How did you tackle the early challenges in these different uh, settings? Did you have a different game plan for each one? How do you start when you are joining a new CS organization? Yeah, so it is so funny to think back, but Screencastify was a way more chaotic than live school. So when I first started at Screencastify, it was February 27th, 2020. And I remember this very clearly because I went into the office like normal on that day. My first day of onboarding was to receive a computer. We had the company wiki where I was reading about all the different departments and what we had done and what we were focusing on. But on the second day, all of Hong Kong had decided that its schools needed to be closed for COVID. And then over that weekend, most of the schools in Europe had closed. And so even though I was going to come in to go in person to conduct case studies, in Chicago public schools that were using Screencastify and prove out the efficacy of using Screencastify to create webcam recordings or screen recordings and how that helped improve student achievement, all of those initial plans just went right out the window because we could see the writing on the wall that COVID was definitely spreading and it was going to come to the U.S. and all of the schools were going to close at a moment's notice. So we decided to completely scrap the idea about going and doing case studies. And instead, they made a, an initial COVID task force. And they said, Laura, we want you to learn as much as you can about the impact of COVID and remote learning on education. What's happening? What are some best practices? What are educators doing? What are school leaders doing? And so it you know, just became, okay, what are ways that I can find this information since it hadn't hit the U.S. yet? So I joined different Facebook groups of like tech leaders in schools who were trying to figure out everything. And then I put together a webinar of educators from schools that were using Screencastify across the world where their schools had already closed so that they could share some learnings about how they were using things like videos and screen recordings to stay connected to their kids and to create lessons overnight for everything that was going to be required of them when they went to remote learning. And so when I started at Screencastify, we had maybe 45 different schools and districts that were in place that were using Screencastify. And over those next three months, that would just balloon to 4,500. And so we didn't 
had a success team when I first started and we had to create everything from scratch. Now at life school, very different, right? They had a really great team in place. They knew exactly why their schools and districts were using live school. They had really great relationships with the teachers. So instead of creating things from scratch, I brought everybody together so that I could really learn from them. And I wanted to ask them to make really transparent to me, like what makes the team really special? What do they care about? How do they make big decisions in this team so that I'm not coming in and doing things dramatically differently and I'm able to hear what's been working really well for them? And what has the history been? What are some of the accomplishments that they've made them really proud? Uh, What has their experience been since joining, since live school had been around for a lot longer? It had been something that I had actually bought for my school back in the day. So I had known of its existence for a lot longer time than Screencast of I. And what were some of the biggest challenges that the team has faced? And then we dived into what do our partner schools really value? So what is it about the live school mission that brings every team member in and that brings every educator in? What testimonials do we have that show that people like using live school and find it helpful in their schools? And why do they choose to use it? What convinces them to stay with live school? What, if anything, has prevented them from achieving their goals with live school in the past? So I did essentially a a series of different listening sessions with my new team and then documented all of this, shared everything that I heard from them, verified asked what they meant. uh, And then I had to meet with each of them individually. Now that I had a bigger picture of the team, I was like, okay, tell me about you, right? So what do you like to see when you come to work and how often should we be meeting or how often should the team be meeting? And when I want to say that I appreciate the work that you're doing, do you want that to be done publicly or privately? And what do you really want to do next with your career, with your opportunities at live school? What do you think that the organization should take on? So instead of it being a kind of chaotic environment where I was just learning as much as I could individually, this became much more of learning about the team that's in place and what's going to motivate them to be really successful moving forward with a new leader in place, right? I don't want to disrupt things before I find out what is happening, what is going well, and how can I help fit into the culture that they already have in place. And moving into what, what you were accelerating into your journey, what drive school versus your time on screen casting point, how did you go about strengthening your team and client connections? Was your approach different in these two words of school, culture, and tech? <laughs> Again, yes, I think they absolutely were so different from each other. So uh, Screencastify had all of these individual educators that were choosing to bring Screencastify to their classroom. So we were a freemium model where the largest number of all of our educators were just really gung-ho about getting video creation in their hands. And they wanted to share videos with their students and with their students' families, right? That was before COVID happened, that was the story of who a traditional Screencastify educator was. But then because of remote learning being thrust upon all of these schools and districts, thousands of them decided, oh, we need a tool to help our teachers connect with their students and with their students' families. Let's get Screencastify put it in place for everybody. And so overnight, it became a top-down decision that I would say needed a success team to help those district-level leaders and those school-level leaders have a vision and a goal for what they wanted to accomplish by putting Streamcastify in place, right? Like, how are we going to implement this? Was every teacher expected to start with this tomorrow, right? There was no time. If we remember that chaos, it was, right, like March 8th, and that was a Wednesday, and we just needed to jump in and do things. We wanted to put success in place to make sure that school and district leaders could see who was creating videos. Because when Screencastify was originally created, it was only going to give the statistics to the individual teacher. There was nothing to group them all together and answer school leaders' questions about which of their teachers were creating videos. And we needed to answer all of these brand new video recorders' inbound questions. So, for example, when I started, we had something like 15 or 20 questions that would come in from all of our teacher users in a month. 
That was February of 2020. By March of 2020, we were getting 8,000 inbound questions. And we needed to make sure we had all of those in. We needed to make sure they all got an answer because there's nothing worse than knowing a teacher is frustrated and not able to connect with their kids because they're waiting on an answer from you. And so we also didn't have any experience in working with district leaders from an organization perspective. So I just invited them all to chat. I just asked if we could take 15 to 20 minutes so I could pick their brains and ask them what kind of help that they would need and what kind of help their teachers would need and their school leaders. And so those initial conversations with our earliest adopting districts really helped then shape how we would implement Screencast by across all of the other thousands of schools and districts. Whereas at Live School, right? My team already had this extensive history of working with partners. They already knew what their goals were, what the vision was. They already knew how we were implementing live school across many different schools, <laughs> right? So I was able to then pick my teammates' brains. I still reached out to as many of our school-level leaders and our educators as possible just to hear it straight from them. And I've heard so many people call this like a listening tour, and I absolutely agree that it is crucial. So you need to hear it from as many of your different partners as possible. Why did they decide to bring live school to their school? What are they hoping to accomplish? What's been really difficult for them? What do they hope to do next? And so pretty immediately, I also began asking my entire team to record all of our calls with partners so that we could share all those learnings as often as possible internally to the rest of the team. Because it's one thing if someone from my team says, oh my gosh, this school needs to have this new feature. We absolutely need to make it possible for them to be able to do this thing. But it's another and more powerful to be able to show that pain on the school leader's face when they can't accomplish something that they're trying to do yet by grabbing that snippet of that conversation and sharing it with our product team. So uh, drastically different approaches. Um, but in both cases, right, you need to talk to the humans that are choosing to buy the tool that you're working with and hear it from them, whether you're doing that for the first time for an organization or you're getting to pick the brain of your teammates first and then still go on that listening tour. Speaking of plans, let's talk about challenges. What are the common hurdles you faced when joining different CS teams and how did you overcome those? Yeah, I think this is probably true for everyone that's ever walked into a school as well. But every team just has different dynamics, right? I was recently on a webinar and I heard Christy Falteruso say this, but every place you walk into will be so different. And that is just absolutely true. The way that they're operating, the way that they're making decisions, the challenges that they're facing, Right. So I was able to build some of the things for the Screencastify success team that I've been able to reference again at live school. But I had to seriously adapt it based off of what the unique circumstances were for my new team. Right. It can't just copy and paste or pull everything over from one organization to another. And so I think the best way to overcome this challenge that every team has a very unique dynamic is that you have to foster that culture of really open communication as quickly as you can. You have to ask everyone questions. You have to actively listen to what they're telling you. You have to ask them to expound upon what they're thinking. And you have to use that really uh, well-intentioned teacher wait time to just sit in uncomfortable silence until they fill in the gaps with all the things that you couldn't know unless they told you. And everyone needs something different from their manager. So I was so appreciative from my teammates at Screencastify who were really bold and told me when I was failing them as a manager. Like I had a support team member who once asked if we could read Radical Candor as a book group. And then after we finished, challenged me to provide her with more autonomy so that she could try new things and I could demonstrate that I trusted in her. And so still really proud of Molly for doing that. Uh, but I think it's it's just so crucial to make sure that you're hearing people, that you're giving them the opportunity to tell you things, and that you're recognizing how every human being, just like when you're a teacher and every student is different, very much true as an adult. All of your team members are going to need different things from you. What do you think are the biggest obstacles in gaining actionable insights for CSDMs? Especially if you're at really small ed tech companies, like I've been knowing like 
who your currently paying partners are is one of the biggest issues. So having the data that you need is going to be the, the biggest obstacle, right? Who, where is everyone located? Who made the decision to decide to buy something? And keeping all of that knowledge as you will undoubtedly shift from one customer resource management tool to another is, is going to be a big one. But then once you know who your partners are, then knowing why they bought. I think so many speak to this that like the sales team will have a conversation, they'll be able to pull out pain points, they'll be able to pull out goals. But are they sharing that information with the success team? Can we capture that in our CRM? Can we track whether we're delivering towards it? Am I able to talk to every new partner that comes in and ask them what they're hoping to accomplish? And then finally, and maybe this isn't true everywhere, but definitely <laughs> the adjunct tools that I started at, being able to showcase the value that partner schools and district leaders are getting out of a tool, right? They need some sort of data visualization that says the fidelity of with which is being used across all of their different educators. They need to be able to see that they are using the different tools in different ways and that those ways are having impact on their students. Because at the end of the day, burly in this space so that they are positively influencing student outcomes and family outcomes in their school community. Uh, but being able to show that <laughs> has been able to be quite tricky. So I've done as much as like lean into writing SQL queries in big queries so that I can power like Google Data Studio so that I could make data visualizations for people. I will say that now that there are tools like ChatGPT and, and all of those things, it might make that, offset, that uh, process way more accessible to non-computer science people. I happen to have that background, so that was a little bit easier to walk into. But usually it's just, yeah, like trying to figure out who you have as partners, why they decided to buy, and how you can show them that they've gotten value from your tool. Speaking about students, how crucial is choosing the right tools and technology for uh, CS team success? Yeah, I have had so many really fun conversations with people where we just walk through like our CS tech stack. But I personally think that the tools can only come after you figured out what is the information and the processes that you need, right? To get started with, even when we had so many unique partners, we ran almost everything in just like our Google Docs and calendar and sheets and slides and meet and we used Slack to communicate with one another. And it wasn't until we stood up any kind of process that we decided we needed to start bringing in a tool. So for example, we knew that trying to schedule something back and forth with different school leaders who had a lot of change in their day, we had a lot of changes in our day, we needed something that would cut that process down. So that would be why we would bring in like a calendaring tool like Calendly. And we knew that in having all these conversations that we were recording with our partners, we needed something that would shorten them to just quick snippets that we could then share with the product team or with the sales team. So we brought in a conversational tool, like a chorus. And then we knew that we needed something that could schedule sequences because it's every partner needs to learn things at a different time. You don't want to dump it all on them on the first day. So we wanted to drip out specific information based off of triggers that they had taken in the product. And so we brought on like a sequencing tool, like a mix fax. And now me personally, I still have yet to implement an actual CS platform. And I know that there are lots of CS organizations that would be horrified by that. Um, but I think that there's a little bit more sophistication that we need to do in terms of all of the learning from the initial experiments that we are running before all those bells and whistles and honestly simplification that the CS platform would bring would help us. And so while we're working with a smaller budget, maybe than some of our <laughs> larger other partners in CS might be working with, we're still focusing on let's find the right process and then we can look at ways to bring in a tool to help us automate it. We speak, to, we speak about beginnings, processes, laying down the foundations, and then we uh, talked about tools. Now I want to speak about building teams. When you are building your team, are there certain qualities that immediately stand out to you as essential? <laughs> I've done quite a bit of recruiting in my time since we have had to scale up teams really quickly. And obviously, I am completely biased having come from the classroom, having come from the school side and now working in education technology that serves those same educators. 
but I am basically always looking for someone that has previous classroom experience and a big bonus if they've had some school leadership experience as well, because I know that they will already be empathetic. They'll have that really strong sense of adaptability. They will own every project that is given to them, and they just have this passion for problem solving, especially all of the problems that the educators that they're working with are facing. So I also realize <laughs> that because I've always worked in really small and quick moving startups, that I'm basically looking for people who aren't afraid to crunch data, right? Because all we have is a whole bunch of data about each of our partners, and we need to figure out who to reach out to next. Uh, they have to be fairly tech adept because we're going to move quickly. We're going to try new things. We're going to make sure that we can be the experts for all the educators we're working with. And they really have to have just a fabulous presence online since the vast majority of the relationships that we build with schools are going to be in a digital setting. So they basically have to come in, have a really strong conversation with me about how they're able to analyze data and then share it in a non-techie way. So using all of our layman's terms with all the educators that we work with. What do you think it makes the, what's the difference between a good CS team and a great CS team? Sure. I think that there are so many really excellent CSMs and CS teams out there that are building relationships with their partners. They're escalating the issues that arise. They're really intuitively solving the problems that are raised by the people that they're working with. And they're really meeting the challenges that their partners say need to be solved for, right? But the difference between all of those good CSMs, CS teams, and the great ones are that they're finding that the discovery process that was originally created by your sales or your growth partners continues throughout the life of the partnership. So they're going to always multi-thread. They're going to find new points of contact. They're going to capture all those testimonials and all the different use cases so that not only are they acting as a great product expert about the tool that they're working with, but also as this really great consultant from a pedagogical standpoint of what the school needs and what the educators need. And they're helping connect the tool to the teaching and learning that's taking place, right? It's not just about crunching numbers in this product. It's about making sure that your kids are achieving more. They're also excellent at just synthesizing multiple people's experiences so that when they say, hey, this is an issue that needs to be addressed, it's because it's grounded in data from so many great examples from the people that they work with. And then finally, when they create a solution that fixes the problem for one of their partners, they share that. They share it internally to the other team members so that everybody's like, oh, that would work really well for my partner too, or externally so that other people in this product's community are able to benefit. But they're essentially acting as that guide to other CSMs and to other CS teams so that everybody benefits. When the alignment in harmony with the team is crucial, how do you keep everyone on the same page and maintain a cohesive team environment? Yeah, I think one of the most crucial things here is that you do find time to meet together, especially since we're so isolated. My team is fully remote. So for example, uh, as a leadership team, we meet every Monday. So that made sense then for or as a success team, we meet every Tuesday so we could use all the learnings from all of the different departments that we're meeting with from a leadership team in order to set our goals for the week, check in, reflect on what's happened. And we've changed that cadence in terms of how often we meet, whether it's multiple times a week or fewer times a week in our busiest seasons, to really make sure that this is what the team finds to be most helpful. But we essentially, right now, we meet once a week to cover uh, everything from how was the weekend, right? So always starting with a temperature check about what are you excited by outside of work? What makes you a human being that you want to share with us? And then from a revenue standpoint, where are we now? Where were we at this point last year? What's our target? How are we doing? Any new business, right? So who are our new partners that we need to onboard and make sure to get started? Who are our returning partners? What wins took place this week? What red flags and warning signs or like fires that need to get put out or issues that are popping up? What are some big bugs that are being requested that we need to prioritize? What are some project updates that we're focusing on? So we also individually have projects that we're pursuing, experiments that we're running. How are things going? Are we stuck at all? And then finally, just open-ended ideas concept suggestions we want to throw out to one another, any upcoming PTO that we want to make sure we're maneuvering around to take care of each other. 
So we do that once a week. And then I meet with each team member individually so we can go through how they're doing, how they're feeling, anything that they would like to highlight or ask for help on, any projects that they're specifically working on that I can provide some guidance or some help to. Every Friday, then we go through specifically what our partners have helped us learn for this week. So what are all the really great insights that we've had from them that we want to share with the others? What questions or blockers did they raise that we still have? And then support, we also meet separately on Fridays to go through all the inbound questions that we had. What did we learn? How do we want to turn those into things we can share with others? Where are we still blocked or what questions do we have? And then throughout the week, we're very much open to just having all kinds of impromptu conversations. So we love to jump into Slack huddles so that you can just share information very quickly, send messages to each other. We'll throw ad hoc meetings onto each other's calendars. We'll do things like quarterly retros to plan out our goals and figure out from a project perspective how things are going. We'll meet with other teams so that we can see the new features that are going to be released or talk to them about the sales process, whatever the case might be. But making sure that all of that is wrapped up in how are things going from a cadence perspective. I don't want to have more meetings than are necessary. And so we constantly review, do we have too many meetings on the calendar? And where can we start to cut those back to give more working time for everybody that's trying to help out as many partners as they can? Every team encounters its share of challenges, especially in customer success. Can you talk about how you handle tough situations and how do you motivate your team during these times? Yeah. So I'm assuming that anyone else that's in education technology knows that a back to school season is just really tough, right? Every single one of your school partners is trying to get started at the exact same time with new teachers that don't know how to work, whatever system it is that you're working with yet, returning teachers who have blissfully forgotten how to do things uh, while they've taken some time to do professional development or connect with their families over their summers. So it's all kind of a gale force every back to school season. And I rely a lot on food <laughs> to my team. So sending them little food items in the mail to make sure that they're able to recharge. Um, I give a lot of individual praise and thank yous both to everyone on my team and to all the teams that we collaborate with. I'll send my own team small gifts like the thanks is a great platform or spoonful of comfort. I'll give company shout outs in Slack to really promote all of the experimentation that they're doing or new solutions that they found. And then I just constantly remind them on any call that we're on that we are all doing the absolute best that we can while we're maintaining our our wits about us and acting in a humane way. Because at the end of the day, if we get completely drained, we won't be the best partners for all of our educators who might be having really tough days of their own. So we have to make sure that we're taking that deep breath, that we're taking those moments away to recoup and relax and refresh and come back and offer all that support that we can to all of our partners. What are some Call me six that often leads to failure or underperformance. And more importantly, how do we uh, fix each of these issues? Yeah, I think one of the first one is like an analysis paralysis, right? You are given so many pieces of data about the partners that you work with that you're often not sure where to start. Should I start with the people who are using the product the least? and try to get them to use it more? Should I start with the ones that are using it the most and have conversations with them about why it's working? Should I start in the middle and just try to move them more towards having more extensive usage? It could be a just complete cacophony of voices of in your head, but also what you see out there online in terms of advice. And I would suggest choosing one, starting there and making that decision, and then explaining to everyone why you're making that decision and carefully tracking how it goes. So I like to think of everything in success as an experiment, right? You're trying to move the needle. You're trying to help people. You're trying to influence. You're trying to help through change management on different partners. And you really just have to start somewhere and then make sure that as you're applying the learnings from that experiment to the next one, that you're constantly failing forward, right? I think uh, that's a big one is that people are afraid of making a mistake at all. And that analysis, that paralysis that's in place is going to be the biggest mistake of them all. 
And I think uh, a second one that often leads to that failure is assuming that, that you know everything, <laughs> right? So I think a lot of times, uh, especially if you're like from education and you're working in education technology, or if you feel like you are the subject matter expert and you're walking in to provide the subject matter expertise, I am no longer a teacher. I am no longer a school leader. And the experience of leading a school and teaching in a classroom changes constantly. I never taught through COVID, for example. So I cannot pre pretend to assume that I understand the challenges that our educators are facing right now in this world where the students had remote learning for one or two and a half years. It's just vastly different than my own experience. So you always have to assume or approach each uh, new experiment or each new conversation with kind of a beginner's mindset and finding out as much as you can about what makes this person tick and what are the problems that are happening in their classroom or what's really important to this school. Because even though you've implemented your tool with thousands of people, you've never done this implementation at this school. Uh, so I think between making sure that you start somewhere but that you always check your assumptions. Those would be the two biggest ways of assuring that you can get past some of the typical mistakes that lead to failure. I am a strong believer that uh, the best lessons are coming uh, are from the ones uh, are coming from the ones that we make because of those mistakes. So uh, I want to ask you, what is the latest mistake you've made in your CS role that's turned into a valuable learning experience? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I've got to share my own losses on this one. I was trying to help a group of schools turn on a feature where they would share automatic updates with all of their family members. And so you have to get family members to sign up for these updates, and then you have to click a button to turn it on in live school, right? My CEO is going to love this, but I essentially way overdid it. So I created this three-touch email sequence. I had a Loom video of me explaining why this would be helpful and how to turn it on. I offered my calendar if they wanted to chat about it. Uh, I also offered to turn it on for them. And I sent out that sequence to right, 25 schools that had more than 500 families who had signed up. And out of those 25 schools, I got exactly one response that was like, sure. <laughs> and so I was like, wow, I, I don't know what I did wrong here. It seems like they've got a lot of really invested family members. It seems like the school has taken the time to get everybody signed up. Where did I go wrong on trying to show, you know, how to get started? Uh, and so my CEO suggested, why don't you just take everything that you did and pare it down to two sentences, right? One that says, here's the number of families who you have signed up and we'll turn it on for you. Just say, sure. And I tried that <laughs> and wouldn't you know it, 12 out of 25 people responded almost immediately saying, yes, please do that for me. And so this is probably unsurprising to all of you out there that work with very busy professionals. But my big takeaways were less is more. So if I can give them the exact information that they need so that it fits on their cell phone as they're going from classroom to classroom or hopping into the car at the end of the day with as few words as possible, it's going to send the message home. And then can I partner that with an ask of, can I help you do this? Or can I do this for you? Something that gives them an easy opportunity to say, yes, please take care of that for me. Or yes, please take that off my plate. So I think as I'm now looking at all the other experiments where I'm reaching out, trying to drive usage or make sure that I'm able to help them achieve the goals that, that they want to achieve, I'm constantly thinking through how can I shorten this copy? So how can I get it down to 250 words or less? And then what's a key metric that would be the reason that they should do something? Like what would drive this decision and how can I help them achieve that? That's my most recent mistake was trying to overload someone with information when they are not going to be able to read it. They're not going to have the time or to be able to watch the video. How can I truncate it and make it easier for them? As we wrap up, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the future. What are your predictions for the customer success industry that we've been before? Are there any trends or changes you foresee that we should all be keeping an eye on? Yeah, I am probably not the first person to say that I think we're going to see a whole bunch more of AI powered customer insights. So whether you're recording a call and grabbing all of the insights from there, or you're searching through all of the emails that you've had with somebody or any other way in which you're engaging with your partners, 
I hope that we'll be able to take the learnings that are coming out of each of those conversations or interactions and create even more personalized customer journeys for them, right? So therefore enhancing all of that proactive support that we can provide them because we're using basically predictive analytics about where we think their journey will go next based off of all the other partners who we've been trying to help. We're trying to make this as clear as possible and we're trying to make sure every one of the partners we work with is successful. So I know that I've seen more and more people moving this way and I think that's a great thing for us. I would also double down on the humans on our team and the really human-centric approaches that we're taking to build and maintain that trust with each of our partners is going to be so crucial, right? At the end of the day, you want to know that someone has heard you, has understood your pain, and is there to help provide a solution to the issue that you're raising because you haven't figured it out yet and you're looking for a little bit of help. So even as we rely more and more on AI insights and all of the things that are coming out that we can summarize across everybody, they're still going to want and we should still rely on uh, the really great <laughs> thinking power that each of us has and each of our team members have to make that interaction with all of our partners as personalized as possible and making sure that they're feeling that trust, they're feeling heard, and that they're being successful. No, no. It was a pleasure talking to you today. Yeah. Thank you for taking the time to share with us so many great advices. You shared your personal experience and I really enjoyed it. And uh, because it's almost end of the year, I want to wish you a happy holidays and take the time to refill, recharge, and be ready for uh, 2024. Yeah, thank you so much. It was awesome getting to dive into these questions with you. And I hope that there are success leaders everywhere out there that are following your advice as well. I think this is the time for all of us to reflect on what's gone really well, what we want to improve on, and then giving ourselves the space to take some time away so we can improve on them because you need a lot of energy to do that. So thank you. And Happy holidays. I hope that your 2024, if it doesn't come with a bunch of resolutions, at least comes with some energy to be able to tackle whatever you wanted to. For sure. Have a pleasant day. Bye. Thank you.